So now let's uh, do a quick review of various load carrying methods. So what's basic is tension and compression. Also torsion. Shear. Uh, as well as bending. Especially bending is very common in aircraft structures. So now let's consider some of the main aircraft structural members. So for the wings and tail, basically these are beams. But they also must resist torsion loads in addition to bending. Since the inside of the wing is typically used as a fuel tank, this reduces the net loading. And you can see this if we sketch out the various loads on an aircraft. There's the center landing gear. Oh. The main gear. Uh, here is an engine. And so we can look at the loading like this. There's a weight concentrated from the engine. There's a weight concentrated uh, from the landing gear. There's a distributed weight throughout the wing. from the fuel, and of course, there's the lift. This might have some arbitrary, seemingly arbitrary looking distribution as shown here. So, these all contribute to bending loads. There's the distributed lift, the structural and fuel weight, and the engine and landing gear weights, which are point loads. Now, if we do our free body diagram of the wing, let's just say here's our wing. And let's simplify what the loading looks like. I'll dip where the engine's located for the lift. There's the distributed weight. as well as the landing gear weight and engine weight. This is the weight of the wing and fuel. This is the lift. At the attachment point here at the center, we have the fuselage weight over two. 
and a bending moment at the wing root. Now sometimes the two wings of the aircraft are a single structure, in which case this moment is internal. Now wings are far from ideal beams since their thickness isn't very large. We tend to want to avoid having too low of a thickness to cord ratio for our airfoils just for that reason. Now if we look at this cord wise, bending resistance is also necessary. You can imagine here's a wing. And here's maybe the lift distribution on that wing, cord wise. There's the pylon, which produces thrust. The engine has weight, and there's landing gear with a reaction force. as well as a drag and rolling resistance force. And just to help tie all this together, there's the fuselage where this is coming out of. So there's also bending along this axis, along this direction, in addition to along this direction. So the wing needs to be strong as bending in both of those directions. There's also significant torsion loading. We need to, and the reason uh, is that we really need to try to prevent excessive twisting, which distorts the aerodynamic loading of the wing. The primary source of the torsion is use of the control surfaces. So for example, the ailerons on this wing um, will cause torsion when on the rest of the wing when they're being used. So to help counteract this, again, if you can reduce the thickness to cord ratio of the wing, that reduces the enclosed area which is not good for twist because the twist resistance is proportional to the thickness squared. So again, a low cord to tip rate, uh, thickness to cord ratio is uh, poor structurally. Other aspects to consider regarding the structure are the wing aspect ratio. So reducing the aspect ratio is good structurally. You can see why you're not cantilevering as much of a load on your beam. But as we'll see, as been hinted at before, and as we'll see in more detail when we discuss 3D wings, a low aspect ratio is an aerodynamic disadvantage. So there's a need to trade off between these two things. We also consider the effect of wing sweep. Um, let me just draw this. Here's the side of the fuselage. There's a straight wing. And that is a swept wing. So what this does is it effectively increases the length of the beam and shifts the wing lift outward. So this is disadvantageous structurally. Also, most wings are tapered. We'll again see why when we discuss 3D wings. There's our fuselage side. Here's a rectangular wing. There's our tapered wing. Somewhat exaggerated. So this moves the lift towards the root of the wing, and so this 
is good structurally. So a typical design solution for building the wing is to use spar and rib construction. So if we sketch our airfoil, do something like that. Spar will be certainly at the front, maybe another one near the back, and then in between will be a rib, which can have all sorts of structural designs, but may, for example, be built like a truss. So the spar is basically a member that's normal to the page here that goes along the span of the wing, front spar, rear spar, and then the rib goes along the cord of the wing, giving it stiffness in that direction. Now let's consider the fuselage. This is basically also loaded in bending and torsion, but it's a much more optimal shape because it's usually roughly circular. So there's a lot more depth in enclosed area to resist bending. Typical construction is a frame and shell. So looking at the cross section, There'll be at various locations a cross section such so cross sectional frames like this. There'll be a passenger deck typically or a main load deck near where the area of natural maximum diameter is, and also an additional cargo deck, say if this is a commercial airliner below. Looking at this from the side, if we sketch the outer side view of the fuselage, we'll have longitudinal members connecting many of these uh, cross-sectional members of cross-sectional frames. So these are the frames, these are the longitudinal members, and over both is installed a skin. And both these longitudinal members plus the skin combined to form the shell of the structure. So this is a distributed weight load, uh, is mainly what the uh, fuselage needs to support. There's point loads uh, at the nose gear and uh, the wing and tail attachment points. Um, and also the fuselage uh, in a pressurized aircraft uh, needs to withstand uh, the, pressure, the, the stresses associated with there being a higher pressure inside the fuselage than in the surrounding atmosphere.